Hey guys, welcome back to Home Built. And in this episode, we're gonna go back over some of the niggling issues we're still having with the Rockster. And we're gonna have a look at the potential oil starvation issue at the track. All right, guys, welcome back. And those of you who are watching recently will have seen that I've uh, finally got the Rockster running with the uh, Audi engine conversion. And uh, we actually have, I put the new exhaust on it, sounds much better, not too loud now. I'm not worried about it uh, blowing out the DB meters at the track. So uh, we still have a few niggling issues. Those who missed it, I'll put a link up above so you can catch up and think about subscribing if you haven't. It does help us out. Hit the bell for the notifications and all that sort of good stuff. Now, um, getting back to the Rockster, there's a, um, there's a few things that uh, I still need to have a look at that, as I mentioned last week, uh, under acceleration, the, the back end feels like it's moving slightly. And when, I, when I accelerate, I feel it move and then back off, it, it sort of moves back. So something is not right under there. So we're gonna stick a GoPro under there later and take it for another test and just, uh, and just see how much it moves around, see what happens, see if we can locate what's moving. Is it the, uh, the engine in the mounts? Is it the, uh, the suspension arms or is it the whole cradle moving? We'll, we'll have a look and see what's moving because there's something's not quite right there. So uh, we can sort that out. But uh, to start with, let's uh, get it up in the air and, uh, and have a quicker look at a couple of bits and pieces. So another quick test drive down, and you can see from the GoPro footage that uh, it's not definitive. The subframe doesn't look like it's moving at all. Um, the GoPro is obviously shaking a little bit, as you can see in this footage here. Uh, but it does look like the engine is moving slightly. What I might have to do is mount the GoPro further up and watching the uh, engine mounts, and so put it in another location and, uh, and then try again and see if I can get something a bit more definitive. From the back, there's not a lot of movement. It also not, I was more prevalent when I touched the brakes, so it could also be the brakes are, are twisting, but I'm pretty sure it's on and off the throttle. So um, there's a couple of tests. I was thinking we can just try and uh, start the engine while it's on the hoist and just rev it and just see how much the engine moves around. It does look like the engine moves a bit when you, when you give it a rev. So it could just be that I need to beef up those engine mounts. Um, there was a little bit of slop in the, uh, the holes that I did for the bolts, which uh, I wasn't really that happy with at the time. That's an easy fix. So uh, let's check that. The other thing is that it keeps, um, it keeps getting a lot of steam when I pull up. Um, there's something going on with the overflow uh, system. I don't know whether I haven't topped it up enough and whether it's, uh, it's actually just, uh, um, you know, it's, it's bubbling in there. And uh, I felt the radiator pipes, the radiator pipes were cold. So there's definitely no fluid going to the front of the car um, or the thermostat hadn't opened yet, but there was definitely bubbling coming from the overflow bottle. So we've got to work out what's going on there. I'm not sure exactly. And uh, we have a power steering leak, but I think it may actually just be the lid might be loose at the top because it seems to be coming from the top of the power steering pump, not the bottom. 
So uh, let's get to the bottom of a bunch of these things. So we learned a couple of things there. The uh, engine, I have the engine cover off and I was revving the engine in from the top. It's not moving at all. You cannot see the engine moving at all, at least while it's sitting still and being revved. There is zero movement on the engine. It's rock solid. It's not even sort of tilting from side to side or anything, like it's nothing. Uh, power steering is leaking like a sieve. It is absolutely pouring out. So there's something uh, not tight there. I'm looking again, I think it might be one of the, the fittings to the hoses going up into the bottom of it. So uh, we need to get under there and uh, look at what we're doing about tightening those things up because that's just pouring power steering fluid out. And um, the squealing seems to be better. So anyway, let's get onto that. And I'm also gonna get underneath and have a bit of look at that uh, brake pedal and just see if it's just sticky. All right, so I just ran the uh, car for a while, then it took a while to start warming up, and then the, uh, the temperature started going up and up and up. It got up to about 100 degrees Celsius, it kept rocketing up, and it looks like the thermostat has not opened at all because the radiator pipes were still cold, so there was definitely something going on there that was not working properly. Um, I have a bit more of a look and, uh, and see what's happening with that and uh, see if we've got a... Um, either a water pump problem or a thermostat problem, I think is probably what the thing is, the deal is with that. So uh, that means uh, back to uh, ordering some new parts, I think. So while we're waiting for the, those parts, I think it's time to start uh, taking you through what I'm thinking about to try and work on our oil surge on the racetrack. All right, so uh, as many of you are aware and have uh, pointed out, and it's something that I was well and truly aware of before I even started this project, was oil surge on the racetrack. And essentially what that is, is um, on normal road driving, you don't notice it on most cars. You can Driving hard on the road is nowhere near like driving hard on a racetrack, particularly when you start putting stickier tires on and things like that. And the long sweeping corners is where things really uh, start to hurt engines, is where you've got a lot of G-forces in one direction for a long period of time. So all the oil in the, uh, in the sump of the engine will be pushed off to one side of the engine, away from wherever the pickup is. And when the pickup runs dry, it starts sucking air. Um, it only takes a couple of seconds of no, no oil going to the uh, the bearings and you'll lose bearings. They'll start wearing metal on metal very quickly and uh, uh, your engine is kaput. And um, that is sort of what happened to the Rockstar's original engine. Um, it was a combination, I think it was more, it was actually sort of sucking water and uh, water doesn't lubricate like oil does. So it was just wearing out and, uh, and it killed the, uh, the bottom end of the engine. The, the issue I have is that the bottom of this sump already pretty much fills the entire area I can use. There's not much room for a sort of a, a, a wing sump, a baffled sump. I can't go any lower because this is already basically the lowest point of the car with this subframe. So there's nowhere else to put a, uh, a bigger sump. Now, the one, a very expensive alternative is to go dry sump like the uh, Ferrari engine has. Dry sump system is a very, uh, is, is the best system to use. It's what the high-end race cars all use, but it's, as I said, it's very expensive. You need a uh, expensive scavenge pump system and then you need a dry sump oil tank. And uh, I was looking for other alternatives and uh, that's where I came across one of these things. This is an oil accumulator. So basically what this thing does is this runs in your, uh, your oil system and it has a tap on the end. You can get ones that have a uh, electronic switch which costs a lot more. This is a pretty basic setup. Um, 
but it's got a, uh, a gauge on the end of it and a little um, car tire nipple on here where you can pump um, a small amount of pressure, probably um, I think generally only about 10 psi or so is all that you need in the end of this. And inside is a uh, is a piston that can just move up and down inside of the accumulator. So you put uh, about 10 psi pressure inside this uh, inside this cylinder, pushes the piston all the way down the end. You plumb this end into the oil. So the way this works is when you uh, start your engine, the the Oil pressure in the in the engine is about 80 psi or so, so it will it will fill this up with with oil much more than the 10 psi you have at this end. It'll keep pressing until it basically squishes all the air up to a, to match the uh, the oil pressure that's uh, currently in your engine. When you're driving along, it just sits here. It's full of oil. It's just sitting here waiting to go. But whenever you happen to go around a corner if you start sucking air if you if your oil pressure drops for any reason this pressurized oil is going to be forced back into the system and keep those bearings lubricated and keep some oil pressure in your system so your oil pressure doesn't drop to nothing it it forces this back in and hopefully by the time that this has expelled all of its uh, its oil back in the system before that stage you have finished the corner and it will fill back up again with oil pressure and and uh, and life is good the other added benefit of this uh, of this system is because it has a tap on it basically if you shut it off before you turn the engine off it's filled with this pressurized oil so uh, it can actually help your engine uh, on startup so you can actually crack this open to pressurize and lubricate force oil through all the uh, through the engine and so when you start it up you actually have a um, a nicely oiled system so you just have to manually remember to start it turn it on and off um, at the uh, the start and when you start and shut down your engine as I said, you can get electronic ones. Um, it makes these things about double the price. They're not overly expensive. So uh, what I'm going to do is I'm going to uh, fit this now in the cabin of the car, which uh, I was sort of looking around everywhere to see if there was alternatives, but that's where uh, most of the race cars mount them in, a, in the cabin so you can actually reach them. Um, that's, that's the way they go. So uh, I'm going to find a spot in behind the passenger seat and uh, see if we can mount this thing in the car and hopefully it will uh, save me on the track from killing another engine. Okay, so I'm in the back of the car and behind the passenger seat is where I think I'm going to mount the oil accumulator. It's uh, going to sit across the back here. Um, the gauge actually tucks in just behind the seat belt down here. So I've got to make some mounts and the mounts go on either end. You can't uh, mount anything in the middle. You'll actually like crush it and stop the, uh, the, the uh, piston moving up and forward. So you've got to place the clamps on either end. So I need to mark it and uh, start working out how I'm going to clamp it in place. All right, so I've been hard at work making these odd looking brackets. I've just uh, sort of folded them up and drilled them in and they look like they're all twisted in odd shapes, but they're actually designed to fit perfectly into the, uh, the locations in either corner here to hold the oil accumulator at either end quite nicely. Now, there's enough room for me to drill some holes in that plastic uh, center console even further to run the hose over uh, out the end. And uh, I'll have to make some clearance so I can actually open and close the, uh, the actual handle itself. All right, so I have my brackets that I've just welded up. So um, basically I just took some uh, metal straps, 
I folded them all the way underneath and welded them all the way around. Uh, so I've got my straps nice and captive. So these are now good to bolt in my oil accumulator. So uh, let's go and do that. All right, so the accumulator's in. As you can see, the uh, Raceworks clamps on either end are nice and solid, and this thing is rock solid. It is not going anywhere. That is a, uh, a nice addition. So now we need to do something about connecting this bit up to the engine itself. All right, so we have our nice solidly mounted oil accumulator. I ended up cutting off the uh, entire back of the center console. I just found it's gonna fit much easier uh, going through that way. Um, and that way I can turn it on, turn it off quite easily. Goes in, tucks in behind the driver's seat and through a Raceworks bulkhead fitting into the engine bay. So I can connect another AN line onto the back of that. Uh, and uh, I'll show you how I'm gonna fit that now. So the way I'm gonna plug that oil accumulator into the engine itself is through one of these things. And this is just a, uh, it's a oil filter uh, sandwich plate, which you can then run um, two lines off of, loop it out and loop it back. Uh, and basically what it is, is uh, you just take off your oil filter, take it off and bolt it on with this in the middle. The issue I have is of course that this uh, sandwich plate that I bought, it ends up, it doesn't actually fit. It comes with a couple of different size fittings, but neither of them are gonna fit the, uh, the factory oil filters, so it's not gonna work. So I'm gonna have to get myself another one. The right size to actually fit the factory oil filter. I just got a universal one, had a couple of different fittings. I'm like, it's gonna fit, I'm sure it's gonna fit. And it doesn't. All right, so uh, I've done a little bit more research and as usual, things are just not gonna be easy on this car. Um, I ordered myself uh, one of these things, which uh, I mentioned is a sandwich plate for the oil filter. So basically you take the original oil filter off, you unscrew it off of the, uh, off of the car, you sit this in place and you have some of these little um, fittings, which have a female and a male side and that screws onto where the original oil filter would screw onto, and then you screw the oil filter on the outside. So basically it's just an extension, and, uh, and then the oil will come through, go out one hose through the oil cooler, and uh, in my case, into the oil accumulator, uh, T into the oil accumulator, and then back in through and, uh, and back through the engine again. So uh, it's just a sandwich plate. The issue is, uh, after having a look, I cannot find any sandwich plate with the uh, right size for the Audi engine. This uh, the right size fitting for the center. It doesn't exist. It's a very large fitting. As you can see, the physical size of the oil filter is the same. The oil filter will will actually fit. It's just that it doesn't. Um, uh, I can't get the center bore the correct size for the Audi. So. Um, Basically what I need to do is I need to make myself one of these in the size. And as I said, it's a 24 by two mil thread. So it's a metric. So um, it's bigger than these. It's actually gonna have to be bigger than the hole that's currently in this. So I'm gonna have to bore this out slightly, but there is quite a bit of meat in the, in the middle here. So I can actually physically bore that out a bit more. Uh, I don't think that's gonna be an issue. So uh, that's what I'm gonna do, is I'm gonna bore that out so that it can accept a, uh, my new piece that I need to make. But the difficult part is I have to make one of these. But making this requires uh, more machining skill than I currently have, so this is where I get to learn again, and I have to cut threads. Cutting threads is not easy. Uh, there is gearing in the machine that uh, most lathes have some sort of gearing on them. And uh, I've worked out the gearing, I've had a bit of a play around, but uh, this is going to be an interesting one. So uh, I'm going to have got myself a bit of hexagonal stock that I've cut off and uh, I'm going to turn hopefully this piece here into uh, something like that. So let's see how it goes.
All right, so I've gone in here and I've now turned down my piece of stock so that the outside diameter is correct and the inside diameter is um, it's 22 mil. I need uh, it's actually just over 22 mil because uh, that is the size that you're supposed to tap out a 24 mil thread. So uh, I've got that there, and I got onto the grinder, and I actually I actually hand ground down this um, piece here so that it will be a nice 60 degree thread. So now I need to uh, line it up, and uh, a little tip that I got from watching some videos online is um, that. Instead, usually when you engage the, uh, the threading uh, section of the lathe, usually it brings the carriage towards the headstock. And then you've got to be really quick on, on shutting it off. Um, a tip that I did see that actually seems to make a lot of sense to me is if you actually flip your tool upside down and then run the machine in reverse, it will still give you a right hand thread, but you're actually running away from the headstock each time. So you bring it in and bring it away and you're much less likely to uh, have uh, little snafus, or at least that's the hope. So uh, I'm gonna give that a go right now and uh, see if we can actually do some threading. Bit stressful, I've got the settings I think I need, so uh, let's give it a go. Well, that was stressful, but I think I've actually got a part that I can use. So there is an internal thread in this. You see there, it's not the cleanest uh, part. I did do a, a test external one the other day and it, uh, and it threads in. So I've got the threads right. This is the right thread because it does screw into my oil filter. So we're on the right track, hopefully this piece that I did actually works. Now, there's a lot of complicated stuff uh, learning about the lathe and the particular lathe for threading. It's not the simplest uh, thing and it was, yeah, quite stressful. It's, it's timing and stuff, but being able to do it backwards was so much better than having the stress of it going towards the headstock and everything messing up, like if it goes too far, whereas you're starting at the back and working away, so when it goes past you can stop it at any time it's easy so um, that bit I was quite happy with <sighs> to be honest that looks like it should do the job so now we just need to do the other end without throwing it on the ground uh, that is an external thread that should be a lot easier I think All right, well we have my fitting it's not the prettiest thing in the world the thread is not fantastic but it does screw onto my oil filter. Hopefully now this end will fit onto the engine. So the next thing we need to do is uh, we actually have to take the fitting itself and we need to actually open up the inside of that a little bit so that we can fit this, uh, fit the fitting through the center of this sandwich plate. I'm so happy with that. It actually worked. I actually managed to machine a part that um, actually resembles and looks like it's going to do the job. I mean, the final test is going to be screwing it onto uh, the engine itself, but it looks like it's going to do it. It looks like it's all the right size and it's the, ha, uh, huh, how good is that? That took me pretty much a whole day to do that. There was a lot of work, um, but uh, it's satisfying. When All right, and it's all in. Uh, we actually have the sandwich plate is all fitted in. The, uh, the, the lines are in. I put a bunch of Raceworks lines in and a uh, T-piece up here. So basically comes out of the oil filter, uh, does a loop and comes back up into, back into the oil filter again. But there's a branch off of the T that goes up to uh, our oil accumulator. So um, that can feed it straight back into the engine again um, as soon as there is any discrepancy in oil pressure. So uh, I think we have a uh, sorted oil accumulator. And 
And I'm not sure how good well the uh, camera's picking up here, but I've actually welded in um, a bit of a brace into these engine mounts because I think that may be where my uh, body movement was coming from, is there was a little bit of slop. The hole that I drilled for the bolt for this was a little bit too large. So basically I've just welded on these plates that hold that bolt a bit tighter. We should be able to see whether that has fixed the uh, engine movement issue. So um, I think we are looking good. Okay, and that is it. That's another whole bunch of work I've done on the uh, the Rockstar, but um, I think we've chipped away at a lot of the uh, the niggling issues. Getting that fitting made, it was a whole day of work pretty much to make that fitting for the uh, uh, the sandwich plate, but it looks like it's going to do the job. I am very happy with the result. So uh, that is it for another episode. Hopefully you enjoyed this, you've got something out of it, and uh, if you are enjoying the videos, please like, subscribe, do all that sort of stuff. Um, join us on Patreon if you want to watch videos a day early and it does help us out. And if you need parts for any of your Porsches, make sure you compare prices at porschepartsbyjeff.com first. All right guys, we'll see you next time.